Questions for Sol. You say um, you think you believe that Australian households hold the key to transitioning to renewables, but why should Australians be expected to tackle the climate crisis that's been created by large corporations and aided by our government's lack of action? Uh. So I, I don't think it should be the household's responsibility to solely solve the climate crisis. But for a very practical reason, I talk about households and small businesses as the near-term emission reductions that we can do. We, could, we can quibble about whether it's 40 or 43 or 50 or 60 percent reductions we need by 2030. It's a, it's a high number. Let's be really frank and honest. Green steel doesn't work yet and probably won't till next decade. Hydrogen at scale won't be done if it's done at all until next decade. So we're not going to eliminate any of these big industrial and other emissions until next decade. How do you get those emissions that you need right now? And it turns out that the technologies, they're a little bit expensive today, but solar was a little bit expensive 10 years ago and now is dirt cheap, um, are the things that are owned by the Australian household and by Australia's small businesses by virtue of being similar things. That's our vehicles, that's our hot water heaters, that's our space heaters, that's our rooftops for our solar and, our, and even our kitchens. So 42% of the emissions that occur in our domestic economy happen from that small set of machines that are in every Australian household. And here's the reality. In the next 10 or 20 years, 10 million households are going to replace all of those machines anyway. So to get to the nub of the question, which is, hey, it's now our responsibility, is it? This takes us to a key point in your book, The Big Switch, about who do you incentivise, who do you subsidise, where does the money go? It's going to be about money, isn't it, in order to enable people to make that change? Absolutely. This is the, the exchange of finance for fuel. So when you build yeah. a fossil fuel system, you have to keep on paying fuel prices and that they have volatility. If you finance solar and the electric vehicle and the things, you have price stability, but you've, you've got to make those payments. So it's that substitution. And very critically, it's why I sort of think about Australia's 10 million households as national infrastructure. It will be where the majority of our batteries live by virtue of they'll be parked in okay. our driveways. Uh, and we need, we need to finance the, our, the Australian household pref with the same preferential financing that we give to infrastructure in Australia. Mm -hmm. And you should think about our cars and our homes in the same way as, and with the same priority that we think about Snowy 2.0. OK. Uh, Zoe Daniel, I feel like you're sort of a household representative this evening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you for the question. And I think my answer to why should we do it as households is because we can. <laughs> and also because we're sick of waiting for our politicians to do it for us. So we have to force it. And I think that's what happened at the election to some degree, that community stood up and said, enough stuffing around. It's time to actually move this needle. And now we have a government that's in place, but sitting underneath that is a group of people that have voted to end the climate wars, to actually move this forward, to incentivise solar, to create an environment where people can actively action the things that Saul's talking about, to electrify their homes. And, you know, there's all sorts of pieces underneath that. The Minister talked about community energy. I've been working with one of the communities in Goldstein about a community energy project. But again, the interaction between the community battery and the grid has to be sorted out mm -hmm. to make that a viable project. So that's a piece of that process. That's a connectivity job. I exactly. To, to make that feasible and profitable for the community, but, mm. but to enable locally generated, stored and used energy to take the, the pressure off the grid. But I think the other thing is, you know, the elephant in the room, I, I feel, seems to be why are we not getting a bigger return on our assets when it comes to our export of gas? And we talked about... <laughs> Virginia, you, you, you said it's going to cost money, and of course it's going to cost money, and it's a complex exercise. Well, you know, there's this windfall profit happening, and uh, the word tax is a dirty word, so let's call it a price equalisation levy. What about if you tax the difference on what those companies were making before the war in Ukraine and what they're making now, and consider how much money that might mean to put solar on rooftops and create this electrification that we're talking about? No, and there's, there's precedent. Norway did this, right? Norway... <laughs> It's even worse than that, Virginia. It's even worse than that. Because you go right back to when we started exporting our energy 
And we put in place a thing called the Petroleum Resource Rent Tax. Yes. We designed a tax that nobody pays. What a clever idea that was. <laughs> now, that's the problem. That is our gas, all of us Australians, and, the, and we sold this gas without getting the tax, the return, which is what he's talking about, should have been coming to us. I mean, the gas users should benefit as well. The companies have obviously got to pay tax, but this idea that we've got that the companies are not paying to use the, the rent on the resource that they're extracting at any likely appropriate rate, that should be fixed, in addition to what Zoe's talking about, when you've got companies making windfall profits. I think there's a challenge there because the, the first one for the minister is a much harder one to fix because resource rent taxes will be very problematic and we know what the industry will say when he tries that. Sure. But the other one I think should be easier. Well, let me go to the minister. I assume I want to hear from um, Sarah on this because I, I think you argue that the companies are paying their, their fair share even though the Australia Institute showed that at least five major companies paid, I think, zero tax in the last few years. Well, Virginia, my members aren't, um, you know, are not as involved in the export market um, and I do think one of the challenges, though, is uh, it's very difficult for governments to retrospectively apply um, taxes and controls on uh, resources that are already being exported overseas on long-term contracts. You've got to be very careful about sovereign risk issues. Um, there may be opportunities to look at uh, how we might better reserve gas domestically for prospective um, gas exploration, because gas is certainly going to be um, a very useful part of our um, energy market transition for, for some years to come. Do, do you regret um, Chris Bowen not being part of a government that actually decided to reserve gas in Australia? And uh, is there still an argument for us to step in and do something about that now? It still will be a key transition fuel for, for us. Yeah, there certainly is an argument for making sure that we have enough gas in Australia from Australian gas production. Absolutely, I agree. And the question is the right tool to do that. And we've announced that we will look at reform there. The, there's a current um, thing called the trigger, but it's not really a trigger. It's, yeah. not really, it's not really designed for this purpose. It's certainly not any, of any use in this purpose. So we have announced that we will look at strengthening that and making that more effective. And, you know, we, we've, we've begun that process because, at the moment, the levers the government have... Uh, has at our disposal a pretty bunt, to be, fr to be frank, and they need to be improved, and we have said that we will do that. We need to look at the problem and what the right solution is. It's, it's very easy to say, here's the problem, uh, but you've got to design your solution very carefully, and a lot of ideas might, might you know, be very worthy ideas, but they don't actually fix this problem. They don't I... actually change this problem before us. So that is, that is a very legitimate debate. I mean, Sarah's right. We do have to worry about sovereign risk. We do have to respect existing contracts. I 100% agree with that. We're not, we're not going to start, you know... Uh, going down that road, but no, but, but, but you have pushed away the idea of a windfall tax. Well, as I said, that's what we're looking at is a, is the correct solution to the problem we're faced. We're facing at the moment, and I don't think that actually would change the situation we're facing at the moment. What might change the situation yeah. is, a, is a more effective lever, a more effective trigger for us to be able to deploy when necessary, reluctantly and not lightly, but when necessary, in the national interest, because the national interest should be should come first. Well, I think the argument's about something that's actually ongoing and constantly, you know, drawing something from our resource. Can I quickly, quickly mm. hear from Tony Wood and from Saul on that? Tony? Well, I would respectfully disagree on this windfall profit tax, because when companies are getting outrageous prices, making huge returns, which has nothing to do with what they've done as clever business people, they were getting returns the above what the they could have normally expected. That's the, that's the core issue, I think. Yep. Now, the Minister's correct. What you need to think of, how would you do something like this? The first thing I would do is to say, look, pay, sell gas into this country at a fair price. Not what, you've been, what you used to sell it at when you had all, all your other gas on contracts. Not take advantage of the situation. Sell it at a fair price or we're going to impose a tax on the profit you're making above a fair price. That would be... You could take it off when the problem's gone away. Yeah. And it seems to me it wouldn't be a sovereign risk risk either. So? I think that's a totally reasonable idea, but I, I think we're, we're playing today's problem where we, we've got to be making today's problem solve the next few decades. And let's look at Norway. They were a very, very gas-rich nation. They made a sovereign wealth fund. They have announced that electric vehicles will be the only vehicles that you can buy in 2025. And that the... Be, by virtue of being a wealthy country from those natural gas windfalls, they mm. are helping subsidise the population into that. Let's talk about that in the Australian context because the energy conversation is always bigger and more complicated than you think. If we were 
buying Australians, helping Australians drive electric vehicles, it would be two cents a kilometre to drive instead of 20 cents a kilometre. Of the $5,000 a year that's hurting people in their energy expenditure, the vast majority for the Australian household is in the vehicles. So we should be implementing uh, price mechanisms, uh, like Tony just mentioned, in order to be subsidising the things that we would like to happen in the future and be using today to pay for it. Just before I go to Ethan Miller, our next question, uh, Mr <coughs> Bowen, anything that you hear there that's terribly attractive to the government? Well, as I said, you know, we're, we're looking at what levers that will work for the situation we're facing. Would those levers work? Well, what would work is, is a reformed and revised um, gas trigger. That's what we think would work. I understand the arguments that are being put, but I don't think they're the right solution for this situation that we're facing at the moment. Now, let's be clear. I think there is a social licence on gas companies. We've been talking to the gas companies and asking them to put more gas into the system, and they have been. But at its core, I do have to say again, this crisis is primarily being led by coal-fired power station outages, uh, not, not, not a shortage of gas in the short term, a shortage of coal-fired power. That's what's, that's what's driving all the action that me and the regulators and the operator and the state and territory ministers are making at the moment. So we're dealing with these issues. But, you know, as I said right at the beginning, we've got to have the medium-term and long-term plans as well at the same time. And that's that national integration, that national plan that I've talked about, including hydrogen and the big conversion that we need to get underway.